James, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We'll be in verses 13, 14, and 15 tonight. James chapter 1, verses 13, 14, and 15. Ted, would you shut that blind again? I envision that coming through. Appreciate it. James, the book of a practical guide for Christian living, as I call it. Book of James. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I want to speak about temptation tonight. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would be with us tonight. I ask that you would take full control of this service. I ask you, Father, to have your will and way. I pray, God, that I'd say only those things that you would be pleased with, but that, God, you would, that we would all receive everything that you give to us. Father, may we want to sit at your knee tonight and learn from you. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Temptation pays a visit to each and every one of us. And most of the time, most of us struggle to say no with temptation. The temptation is not new in any sense. It's been around since, uh, well, Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan tempts us to today the same way he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. And from the very beginning, there has been a battle for the souls of men and women. And it's a battle that touches all of us sooner or later. And most of the battles that we face, temptation, will not be enormous battles, will not be huge battles. They'll not be life-changing decisions, or at least they won't seem that way at the time. Either we get angry or we don't. You stay up late and finish your homework or you find a creative reason why not to. You decide you're going to exercise and you're going to get up early in the morning and then that alarm goes off and you reach over and that first exercise is hit that snooze button for another 30 minutes. No one's going to know these things, you know. Now, the exercise thing will show up. <laughs> the homework thing will show up. You know, you may have decided that, you know, I am not going to use my credit card. And then you go to Kohl's, and they have got this great sell on it. And then you don't have your cash Kohl's money. No? I'm not looking at you. I'm, at that, I'm looking at that thing behind you. <laughs> but... And then you, what do you do? I'm going to use my cash, but just a little bit more, so I use the credit card. You know, temptation, temptation. God has ordained that our spiritual progress should be measured, not by the huge battles, won or lost, but by the thousand daily skirmishes, those little battles we have every day. Every day. The ones that no one else knows anything about. Talking about temptation. How can we fight and win a battle against temptations that we face every day? Well, here we have three things that I want to point out that James talks about. He talks about where it begins. He talks about how it grows. And he talks about where it ends, temptation. In James chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. It's always easy to blame God for our problems. Lord, you, you put me in this situation. Lord, you know my desires. Lord, you knew I was broke. You knew I was broke. Lord, you knew I was weak in that area. Mark it down. God is never the source of your problems. He's never the source of my problems. We shouldn't even go there. We shouldn't even go there. He doesn't tempt people. He never puts us in a situation that 
we have to make a decision to sin. God is not that way. God will never lead you to a place where you have to do evil. You might find yourself in a tough spot or under pressure. Now, you may choose to do evil, and in your mind you feel forced by the circumstances to do wrong. But even in those circumstances, the choices are yours. They're not God's. God never sets us up to fail. Never sets us up to fail. To do that would contradict both his holiness and his love. James chapter 1 here, uh, the word can be translated trial or temptation, and I'll explain that in a little bit. You see, it can be a trial and or a temptation. God sends a trial. Satan turns it into a temptation. For instance, a sickness comes to a child of God, and it might be a sickness or an illness to the point of death. Could that sickness be a testing from God? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's always a test from God to purify motives, and that's what God is doing with us, to make us aware of our frailties, our shortcomings. That's why God allows these diverse temptations as we fall into them. Many good things are accomplished through sickness in the life of the believer. It's hard to believe. And yet it's true. Does Satan work through sickness? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Through that very same sickness, Satan will work to tempt you to despair, to anger, to bitterness, even to depression. God has a purpose in mind, but Satan is working to try to pull you down. Maybe you lose your your job. Could that be from God? Yes, it could. God might have something better in mind. He might have something that's going to promote you into a better paying position. Uh, He certainly wants to build some spiritual character in your life. And yet, during that time when you've lost your job, that the trials from God, Satan will tempt you to anger and despair and discouragement. If you've ever been without work and you look for work, and you can't find work, how frustrating it can be. How frustrating it can be. Do we make it a temptation? Or do we just go through the trial? Perhaps you get that promotion and you get a raise. It can work the other way. You get this nice promotion and in a, in a very substantial raise. Praise God. Prosperity is a test from God to see how you will handle this blessing. Do we consider that? Sometimes we look at it and go, oh, now I can get that boat. Oh, I can get this. Oh, I can get that. When God is giving us the money to be more generous, more loving, and more sensitive to the needs of others. Because look around, folks. There are many people far less fortunate than us. God has given us so much. But is this a temptation that we turn into being a greedy, selfish Christian. It used to be maybe only on a trip, a business trip. Now we can do it right on our phone. I'm talking about the temptation of going and viewing things that we should not be looking at, things that we should not be watching, things that should not have a part of our lives. You know, as you open up your phone and you get on that phone, guys, and even gals, you get on that phone, something pops up. What do you do? Did God know it was going to pop up? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. What are you going to do? Turn it off. Get off of it. Get away from that. It's when you pass the test that you'll be stronger. You'll be spiritually stronger because you said no. Is it a temptation? Yes, it is. It's a temptation to give in to lust. A trial becomes a temptation when we respond incorrectly. What God means for good, Satan means for evil. Just mark it down. 
He's a great counterfeiter. God has this in mind for you. Satan will take it 180 degrees the other way. Satan twists that which God gives us, and he whispers in our ear, Go ahead. Go ahead. Nobody will know. Nobody will know. Only we will know. Because what's in your heart comes out here. It will eventually come out. Well, we talked a little bit about where it begins. Okay. How does it grow? Back to scripture. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Notice four things about this portion of the scripture. There's a certainty of temptation. But every man is tempted. No one, no one escapes the temptation in life. It applies to everyone. I can't remember the name of the song, but it goes, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Come thou found. It's very true. It affects every one of us. Oh, sister so-and-so that's 93. Yeah, sister so-and-so that's 93. You mean brother so-and-so that's been in church, he's 95 and he's been in church 90 years of his life? Yes, brother so-and-so. You mean our little, yes, your little, yes. It affects everyone. It touches everyone. It touches everyone. It's the certainty of temptation. Secondly, there's an allure of temptation. When he is drawn away, James uses the image of a fisherman baiting a hook. And in my mind, I watch in my mind's eye Satan taking that hook and hanging that bait out there to capture us, to hook us. And guess what? He wants to sink the hook deeply. A good fisherman knows how to sink the hook. If I go out and fish, I like to fish. I enjoy fishing. I know Ricky back there likes to fish. And how many other fishermen we got here? Okay. And you know how to set the hook. I might catch a fish and get him halfway to shore. I don't want to get out in the boat and do fishing, folks. Okay? But I'll, I'll fish from the shore. And uh, he might get off the hook because I didn't set the hook properly. Guess what? Satan's a great fisherman. And he knows how to set that hook. Just like Eve, when she looked, uh, list, uh, when Eve looked at the fruit, it looked good to her. It looked good to her, and that bait on that hook looks good. And sin, you know, always looks good. Sin is enticing. It brings a certain degree of satisfaction. Our sin. Let's be real. Let's be real. It must not. Or we wouldn't sin. There's such a thing as the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, we can always justify, it seems, losing our temper, or telling a lie, or cheating a friend, taking a shortcut, indulging our fantasies. When he is drawn away, when he is drawn away, we're talking about temptation. Temptation, the individuality of temptation, says, of his own lust and enticed. You know, it's interesting. What you have a problem with may not bother me at all. And what bothers me and I have problems with may not bother you at all. Of his own lust and enticed. Of his own lust enticed. I think that we've done ourselves a real disservice when we practice sin and we show Satan what's in my mind and in my heart. He's not all-knowing. But when I reveal it to him, he'll use it against me. You know, you look out of the congregation. Take a look around. Take a look around. Everybody look around. Kind of catch somebody's eye as you're looking around. Jeffrey, look around. Find somebody. Look at somebody. Okay. All right. We all clean up pretty good, you know. I'm going to suggest that some of us have spent some time in front of the mirror. Some of us more than others. That's a joke. 
but we clean up good, and we dress up, and we look nice, and we come to church, but we look far better on the outside than we do on the inside. If we could see and reveal the truth of us, the naked truth of us, we would, to a person, get up and run out of this building. If we could see the evil that's in my heart, that's in your heart, the temptation, my own lust and enticed, and then the result of temptation, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. James uses a metaphor here of birth. Lust hath conceived. So let's stay with that theme. If we do not use some spiritual birth control, our thought life, our desires will impregnate our actions, and the result will be a whole bunch of little sin babies running around. Okay? I'm talking spiritually. What James started with. We must not trifle with temptation. Trifle means a thing of little value of importance. We can't trifle with it. We can't mess with it. We can't play with it. We can't dabble with it. Because temptation leads to desire, and that leads to sin in our lives. So we've talked about where it begins, how it grows, and, and where it ends. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, we, every time you hear of someone's going to have a baby, people begin to plan. And they get this ready to send out invitations, and they get ready to have these baby showers. And Oh, they're so... Well, I went to a baby shower the, on uh, Savannah's baby shower, right? Uh, you know, it was okay. Had some good food and all that, and I like that, but yeah. But I sure like that baby part. I sure like that baby part. What happens during the pregnancy? You take pictures of the sonogram and you post it on Facebook. They have gender reveal parties. They send out these elaborate birth announcements. In my day, it was a big thing. They'll go down and get uh, seize candy and get one of those suckers. It's a boy. It's a girl. Well, that was a big thing. It's hard to find anything more wonderful than the birth of a baby. It really is. But you know, not all babies are beautiful. Now, your babies, babies are, but not all babies are beautiful. James uses the image of childbirth to remind us of an awful reality, that our evil desires grow over time, and they take on a life of their own. If you'd fall into temptation, if you walk in temptation, if you give over yourself over to temptation, it will fashion you. And then one of those day, one day as it's fashioning you, those desires will give birth to sin. And then sin, once it's conceived in the heart, according to God's word, only brings forth death. It brings forth death to us. It brings death to our relationships. It all goes back to the Garden of Eden. Why don't we go ahead and turn back there to Genesis chapter 3, if you will. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Bear with me as I turn these lumber pages. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 6. Eve had just finished talking to the serpent. Verse 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they saw that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? 
And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said unto him, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, uh, tree thereof? I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. I did eat. Certain came along, the serpent came along and deceived Eve. Eve was deceived. It looked good to her. So she went to her, to her husband, who should have given her good counsel, and said, no, we've been commanded not to eat of that. But what did, he, what did he do? He sinned willfully, and he ate of that tree. Suddenly, they recognized their nakedness, and they were ashamed. You know, that's a side note here. We've lost ashamed in our country. There is no shame anymore. That just shows you how far we have come from God. And now they're in the garden and they're hiding themselves. Adam is cornered. He's caught red-handed, stripped of all his excuses. What does he do? He does what any self-respecting man would do. He passed the buck. He passed the buck. He said, uh, <clears throat> the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Passed the buck twice. First it was the woman, then it was the woman you put here. Lord, it was her fault. It was her fault. Kind of goes back to, you knew the situation I was in, Lord. We're blaming God. She gave me the fruit, so I ate it. What was I supposed to do? She's my wife. And she's kind of cute, and I didn't want to hear her complaining, so I ate. I ate. Anyway, who put her in the garden? You did. You did. Blaming God. She wasn't my idea. I'm not complaining about her. I'm not complaining about her. But I didn't have this problem. It was just me and the animals. That's kind of silly, sounds like, but not so far off base. But that's just like us. When we're caught red-handed, what do we do? We still try to pass the buck. We still try to say, it's not my fault. It's been thousands of years and nothing has changed. Human nature is the same. We're the same. Passing the buck's in our bloodstream. Disobedience led to guilt. Guilt. Led to shame. It's in the garden, hiding. Shame led to fear. I was afraid. Fear leads to hiding. Hiding, which leads to blaming others. That's the progression. But back in the chapter previous, in verse 17, it said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, think about it. <clears throat> I don't know how many trees were in the garden. But this was a beautiful garden. And I know that when you get in garden areas and settings, I like flowers and what have you, but trees, to me, make it beautiful. Let's say there were 25,000 trees. I don't know. Just pick a number. He said you can eat of 24,999 trees, just this one. Just this one. Isn't that so much like God with us? I just want you to do this one thing. I just want you to do this one thing. Hey, parents, we do this all the time with our children. Here's my instruction. This is what I want you to do. Whatever you do, I don't care, but just do this one thing. Just do this one thing. And we come back and check on it, and it's not done. Or it's been done incorrectly. <clears throat> so 24,999 trees to enjoy. You can have a pear or an apple, an orange or a grapefruit. You can make a fruit cocktail. You can go up that tree, a coconut tree, and Get a nice coconut down and drink the milk out of there. You can have everything you want. Or you maybe you can take and make one of those fancy fruit pizzas. Yuck. Fruit pizza. How many have had a fruit pizza? And you like, never mind. She, she liked it. You, you like it. I know you like You like fruit. Well, you know, I'm a meat kind of guy. At any rate. But go ahead. Indulge yourself on any of the trees. Eat as much as you like. Whatever you like. Just this one tree. Just this one tree. You know, I can imagine Adam, as he's given this instruction, are you sitting there? Yes, Lord. 
Yes, sir. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He might have, <coughs> when he heard the warning, he might have said, okay, okay, okay. And yet, he ate willingly. It's almost as if he couldn't wait to sin. I mean, this was his first temptation. And he failed. He failed. And we see what has been the outcome of that, haven't we? The world. And ever since, anyone that's been born, we all crave some forbidden fruit that is out there in front of us. We're born craving the fruit that leads to death. We eat it, and we can't seem to get enough of it. And that's why the world's so messed up. We demanded our freedom, and when we got it, it killed us. You see, sin kills. And that's what James means when he said sin, sin gives birth to death. Sin kills us. Sin kills every human relationship. Sin kills our relationship with God. When sin is full grown, now you have the monster of death. We need to look at sin like it really is. Hideous and ugly and causing death. There's nothing beautiful about that. We need to consider the impact of our evil desires. McKee Road Baptist Church. What starts as a passing fancy, oh, you know, becomes a desire. And then that desire, we think on it, we meditate on it, we drink on it like we should be doing with the Word of God, tearing it up and chewing it and eating it. And next thing you know, it becomes an overpowering impulse or a really strong desire. It leads to a foolish action. And it results in personal tragedy. It results in shattered lives. It results in hurting children. No one here would set out to hurt a child, I don't think. Not on purpose. And yet the sin that we step into can do just that. It ruins careers. It causes broken marriages. Why? Oh, passing fancy. Oh, a little desire. Oh, I don't have to watch that. Overpowering impulse. Worst of all, we end up separated from God who made us. I'm not talking about being separated from him by salvation. I'm talking about we've just broken fellowship with him. We're truly lost, and we only have ourselves to blame. So what should we do? Don't court sin. Don't play with sin. Don't dabble in sin. Don't give your mind over a temptation to, uh, to bitterness, envy, and anger, or greed, or violence, and lust. Don't give yourself over to that. I think sometimes we become uncomfortable when we talk about temptation. We need to talk about this. It affects us all. Let's suppose you have a big jar of muddy water. And you want to change that jar into clear water. So what's the quickest way to do that transformation? Well, you go and get your hose and you put it in there. Maybe it's hooked up to an artesian well, good, clear, clean, cool water. You plug it, put it in there, and you turn it on. And what happens? It begins to flush out all that muddy water. And as the water rushes in, it cleans it more and more. If you let the hose stay in there long enough, the muddy water will eventually become displaced by the clean water. It's like the Christian life. Consider yourself a big jar of muddy water tonight. When we come to Christ. Some of, you, some of us are muddier and maybe a little bit more slimy than others. Don't you hate that real slimy water? You ever been stepped in a little slimy water and you go, ooh, I don't want to even look and see what that was. But all of us are unclean. And we find the Lord, and the Lord finds us. And now we're his child. 
Guess what? It's the work of a lifetime to replace the muddy water in you. It's the work of a lifetime to replace the muddy water in me. Replace the muddy water of our sinful inclinations with pure water of God's holy character. That's what we're trying to do. We need to take this hose of God and put it into us so we can flush out that muddy water. Your love, O Lord, come into me and drive me out of my anger. I need to love, Lord, because there's anger in my life. I'm greedy, Lord, so I pray would you bring your holiness into me. May I participate in your holiness. Lord, I have lust issues. I need your purity, Lord. I need your purity. Your mercy, Lord, fill my soul and wash away my envy. Your patience, Lord, come in and my impatience will vanish. Your grace, Lord, fill me within and I can forgive. All that you are, Lord Christ, all your shining beauty, all of it, come in this moment and fill me now. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. We need to take a long look at the Son of God who struggled in the wilderness and won victory over the devil. And if he can win the battle, so can we. Because his divine power is available to us. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. There's a story, a testimony about a man that was on the East Coast. He was a big fella. He'd lived a sinful life, and he was a hard fella. But he was wonderfully saved. It was said that when he became a Christian, even his cat knew he had become a Christian. He got saved. He was heading one way, and God saved him, and he's heading the other way. And it wasn't too long after he was saved, he had to go into town. And he began, as he's walking, coming into town, he came up and got closer to the saloon that he would go into. And that was his problem, drink. And he could smell, he could smell that saloon, he could smell the liquor, the odor gripped him, began to overwhelm him because that had gripped his life. The man became frightened and he wondered how he could get by the saloon. Every time he'd gone there before, gone by it before, he'd always stopped in, but now he's saved and he did not want to go in. What to do? He said, as he told his testimony, he smiled and said, I remember, and I said, Jesus, you'll have to come along and help me get by. I never can myself. And he came, and we went by, and we've been going ever since. And that's what we need to do. As we start through this life, and we're battling with temptations and lusts and things that we should not be involved in, ask God, come alongside. Walk with me. Take me through this. I don't want to be a part of this. Let's bow our heads for prayer.